Jim Oakes. I'm a historian uh, specializing in the history of slavery and anti-slavery in the United States. Written several books on those topics. Yeah, we're going to talk about your book, uh, The Crooked Path to Abolition, Abraham Lincoln and the Anti-Slavery Constitution. And I would love for you to just kind of begin by telling us um, what brought you to this particular book and um, kind of why did you write it and what did you uh, discover while re uh, researching it? Well, there's a long answer and a short answer. Um, <laughs> the, the short answer is I had a bunch of essays I had written on various aspects of the topic and was thinking about other aspects of, of the topic. And my editor said, why don't you put it all together into a book? So I did. Um, the long answer is that about after writing two books on the history of slavery in the United States, I decided I needed to understand anti-slavery. So every, I wrote the first book I, I wrote a chip uh, uh, between Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. And that was my first introduction to aspects of anti-slavery thought. And ever since then, I've been backing into the next book. So <laughs> after I finished that book, there's a, the, the, one of the climactic scenes of that book is when Frederick Douglass is called to the White House by Abraham Lincoln in 1864 or August of 1864, and Lincoln believes he's going to lose his re-election bid and asks Frederick Douglass to help organize a group of, of uh, black northerners who could go into the South and get as many slaves to emancipate themselves under the terms of the Emancipation Proclamation as possible before he loses the election. And I was stunned by the fact that as late as all August of 1864, both of these guys who were brilliant and understood things better than most of us do, uh, thought emancipation hadn't been, wasn't a, wasn't a sure thing yet. And so I decided I was going to write a book about how long it took to get slavery abolished. Why did it take so long, even during the Civil War? And th th in that book, uh, I started where a lot of historians start at the earliest months of the war with this famous incident at Fortress Monroe when Benjamin Butler, General Union General Benjamin Butler, decides not to return some slaves who had come to his lines. And that's often the start, right? That's when he asks for permission not to return them, and he is given permission not to return the slaves. And uh, I thought, um, the next thing you look at is the July session of Congress, where Congress passes uh, a famous Confiscation Act, except all the books and all the articles on the Confiscation Act said uh, they didn't do anything. So I said, well, what did they think they were doing? And I read the debates, and I was stunned by how committed the Republicans in Congress were at that early date to emancipating. And I thought, they can't have just thought this up. So I went back to the secession crisis, and I found all the Republicans saying, you know, you leave the Union, and that's the end of slavery. And I thought, wow, wow that's even earlier than I thought. And I just kept going backwards. And then I, uh, uh, I, I went a little bit backwards in that book, and then I went backwards again in my next book on the anti-slavery origins of the Civil War, a book called The Scorpion Sting. And along the way, I noticed that uh, none of the anti-slavery people, the rat most of the radicals and most of and virtually all anti-slavery politicians believed the Constitution was an anti-slavery document. And I I came up as a Garrisonian. Garrison William George Garrison famously denounced the Constitution as a compact with the devil, uh, an agreement in hell. L, a, a pro-slavery atrocity. And then I started thinking, well, <laughs> even if he's right, what does it matter if nobody believes it? You know, the pro-slavery Southerners certainly believed it, but the anti-slavery people didn't. And in fact, it turns out in, in making those observations about the Constitution, Garrison more or less made himself marginal to the anti-slavery movement. So I said, you know, listen, I'm going to have to figure this out. What is it? What is this anti-slavery constitutionalism that all these people believed in? And that's where that book came from. I said, like, it needs it needs a 500 page book. I mean, somebody has to go back 
correct all the mistakes I've undoubtedly made, but I thought, let me just this is this is where I think it came from. This is what it what the larger outlines look to me right now. Uh, in the context of a body of scholarship that doesn't even isn't even aware of this for the most part. So it's a sort of a throw it out there as an opening statement book. Yeah, and I, it's uh, it's pretty incredible, and I I really appreciated the kind of the two things you do in the book really well, and the the first one um, guy I want to talk about is this idea of the the Constitution being anti-slavery, and you know we're kind of we understand that there's um, a tremendous slave power in the United States, and but there's only really two things in the Constitution: right. the Fugitive Slave Act and uh, the three-fifths clause. And could you kind of explain to us how you came to see those differently as you looked at it as an anti-slave constitution? Well, uh, I, I should make clear to uh, people watching or listening to this that I'm not, I'm not really saying the constitution is an anti-slavery document. I'm, I'm saying that, uh, that anti-slavery people believe are an anti-slavery document. And I'm arguing that uh, the at the Constitutional Convention, there were pro-slavery and anti-slavery delegates, and they had to compromise, and the pro-slavery people got some things, and the but the anti-slavery people did as well. And we need to recognize that. And from that, a constitution that could be read differently by different people, because it contained both pro-slavery and anti-slavery elements, uh, we got a, a uh, over time, the emergence of a pro-slavery constitutionalism and an anti-slavery constitutionalism that reached their peak of conflict in the 1850s and leads to the Civil War. So that's that's that's. I want to clarify that that's my ar argument, not that the Constitution is an anti-slavery document. So what are the the the, the I think the three-fifths clause is basically a pro-slavery clause. It's one of the pro-slavery clauses of the Constitution. I don't think that, that argument is a slam dunk. I, I, I had a, a, a talk with my friend Paul Finkelman the other day, uh, who is most famous for arguing that the Constitution is a pro he took the three-fifths clause out of the Constitution. How many slaves would be counted? And the answer is five-fifths. So putting a three-fifths clause in the Constitution reduces the number of slaves counted. And that's the point that Frederick Douglass and others were making in Reconstruction, because once the slaves are emancipated, the representation of the southern states goes way up, right? Because all of a sudden, all the freed people are counted, whereas only three-fifths of the slaves have been counted. So again, I think it's a pro-slavery clause, but it's not an unambiguously pro-slavery clause, right? So that's one thing I think we should keep in mind. The Fugitive Slave Clause, there are a couple of things about that that I think are important. The first is that it that it emerges as part of a quid pro quo, right? You first see it in, uh, uh, in the Northwest Ordinance, which was passed by the Confederation. Congress, while the Constitutional Convention was meeting in Philadelphia, the Confederation Congress in New York passes a Northwest Ordinance which contains the first fugitive slave clause and the authorization by for Congress to ban slavery from the Western territories. And this, and this, if you read the the first proposal by Nathan Dane of Massachusetts for that article in the Northwestern, it says quite clearly, neither slavery nor involuntary service shall be permitted in the Northwest Territories, provided that if your slave runs away, you can come and get it, right? So there's, a, there's an anti-slavery part of the Constitution that says Congress is allowed to ban slavery from the territories. And if you know anything about American history and the buildup to the Civil War, you know that that issue is central to understanding the sectional conflict. And the Constitution authorizes Congress to do that. And it does it. It does it. And there are constant fights over that. So that's in the Constitution. And then finally, you know, I could go on and on, but but um, <laughs> there's, there's a the, there's a clause in the Constitution, the first such clause ever in the history of the world, authorizing the new national government to uh, shut down the international slave international slave trading in the United States. That that's the first time that ever happens. 
no other country had ever d d put such a thing, much much less put it into their fundamental law. And that's, that, is, that seems to me an anti-slavery victory as well. Uh, uh, but there are other things, you know, that, you know, uh, a, a very distinguished historian, Sean Malentz, has argued, and I think it's plausible that that uh, the slaveholders tried and failed to get an explicit property right in slaves into the Constitution. So that's that's an important thing that's missing from the Constitution and becomes an important part of the debate over slavery in the United States. Abraham Lincoln, in his famous um, Cooper Union address, that the, the, the speech that supposedly got him the Republican nomination, uh, it went on and on and on about there's no such thing as a constitutional right of property. The, they don't use the word. you know. So instead of just saying, oh, they were embarrassed and only said persons when they meant slaves, there's some evidence that it was more than that, that they were ex explicitly trying to keep the idea of property and man out of the Constitution, right? So there's an absence that is significant, right, in the Constitution that we don't really need to think about. And finally, there is there is what I, what it's not what I call, what's called the federal consensus. That is the assumption that everyone had, but isn't in the Constitution, that the federal, that slavery is a state institution, not a national one. And that has profound implications for anti-slavery politics. What can the if Congress can never, never abolish slavery in a state, what kind of anti-slavery politics are possible? And so the Constitution sort of by by that premise, by the Federalist premise, shapes the way the politics of slavery can and cannot evolve over the course of the next half century. Yeah, that, that's perfect, because I wanted to then now talk kind of a little bit about the territories and okay. the idea of exactly what you were talking about, whether there's a what the Fifth Amendment with the species of property versus property in man. And, um, you know, kind of you could tell us the tension that was going on in the territories and kind of the two arguments about um, on both sides. Well, uh a, a territorial uh, there's conflict over slavery in territories as early as the 1790s when uh, 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 the question of what they're going to do with uh, you know they, they have to decide what they're going to do with with uh, the territory that is ceded to the United States by Spain in 1797 the Treaty of San Jacinto which is where we get Alabama and Mississippi from. And some people in Congress are proposing to ban slavery from that territory. That's uh, that's actually inconceivable because at that point slavery is already there, and the and and the the question Congress therefore faces when it has to deal with how to treat those territories is not should they have slavery or not. It's should they be admitted to the Union with slavery or should they be independent or should they go with France and Spain? And nobody wanted them to go with France or Spain or Britain because that would, be, you know, if you're if you're in favor of an independent confederacy as early as 1800, then the game is up, right? And by then, Virginia has ceded Kentucky to the United States with 50,000 settlers already there. And there is, it's absolutely inconceivable that Virginia would have done that if, if the Northwest Ordinance restriction on slavery north of the Ohio River had been applied south of the Ohio River. So there's conflicts right from the start over this. There's conflicts over what to do with the territory that, that comes in with the Louisiana Purchase. And for a year or so, Congress actually did ban slavery in that territory. But the real conflict begins to erupt after, right after the War of 1812 ends with questions about the admission of Alabama, Mississippi. It looks like something nobody expected in 1787, when the Constitution was written, when when nobody was growing cotton, uh, and, and there was lots of people thought slavery was dying, all of a sudden, it's not only is it not dying, it's robust, it's expanding dramatically. And for the first time in the Missouri crisis, you get a Northern Congress, a Northern majority in the House of Representatives that says, no, well, you know, we don't want to admit any, any more slave states. We claim the right to uh, require a state to abolish slavery as a condition for admission to the Union. And a majority of Northerners in the House stuck to that position, but they were over, over 
balanced by the three-fifths clause, which gave the Southerners more power in the House than uh, than they would have had, and you know a small minority of Northerners. So from that point on. You know, the since you can't debate whether Congress can or cannot abolish slavery in the state, the debate, the debate often figures plays out as a debate over what Congress can do to slavery in the territories. Right. So it's one of the two big places where a conflict over slavery can arise. And as we know, continues to arise. It's going to arise again, especially after the Mexican session in the 1840s when when once again a majority of northerners say no slavery in this territory we've just taken from mexico and and that that is one of the two major causes of the civil war and it wouldn't have existed had there been uh, no commitment to a federal consensus that would have allowed a direct debate on slavery or not slavery in a state if congress could abolish slavery in a state but it couldn't so it fights over slavery in the territories and the expansion of slavery is that is that the, the i'm not yes. sure if that's yeah that was answer. perfect that was exactly what i was looking for because it was that it sets up kind of um, what i wanted to ask about next which is kind of moving into lincoln and i think okay uh, what i liked about uh, the book is uh, um, the last book I read on Lincoln was uh, Noah Feldman's uh, book. Oh. About, yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> so it was it was a, it was a refreshing uh, response, I think, uh, palate cleanser, as it were. But um, in the book, you you write this sentence, which I think um, I would love for you to talk about, which is, "I've become convinced that a full understanding of anti-slavery constitutionalism is necessary for." For a full understanding of the origins of a single of the single most important achievement of Abraham Lincoln's presidency, the restoration of the Union by means of a revolutionary overthrow of the largest and wealthiest slave society on earth. And when I read that, I went, "Ah, this is a, this book I'm keeping forever." So I, I would love for you to <laughs> I would love for you to tell us um, what that means. Uh, what that means. Well, I do think that. You know, uh, I do think that the abolition of slavery was a, the most important revolution, social revolution in American history. I mean, the destruction, as I said, by 1860, the slave states constituted the largest and wealthiest slave society on earth, maybe the largest and wealthiest slave society in the history of the world. You know? um, but certainly the largest on earth. And to destroy that, to destroy a system uh, in which f 4 million of the 12 million people living in the Stouts were enslaved and to just destroy it that way, destroy the the economic system on, that was built around it, to destroy the, the slaveholding class that had exercised so much influence in the federal government up to that point is truly astonishing. Astonishing, And all of the fights that we have subsequently have in the United States about civil rights, about racial equality, presuppose that revolution. You can't have a civil rights movement for slaves. Nobody believes that slaves have civil rights, right? It's, it starts immediately, right? And the next thing you get after a, a constitutional amendment abolishing slavery is a constitutional amendment guaranteeing the citizenship rights and recognizing this that blacks were citizens if they were born in, right followed by another a constitutional amendment that grants blacks uh, or bans uh, vote uh, racial discrimination in voting right uh, it, so in in one sense uh, th there had been civil rights movements in the northern states prior to the civil war because the same issue applies. They had abolished slavery and blacks began struggling with their white allies for equal rights there. But but as a national struggle, it it, it presupposes emancipation. It presupposes emancipation. So I, I guess that's what I mean. I mean it's, it is. There's nothing like it. There's no there are uh, there are very important transformations in the status of women in the United States. There are struggles but we continue to have struggles over the status of immigrants in the United States, you know, workers' rights struggles and things like that, but nothing as enormous and and profoundly transforming as the destruction of the slave economy and slave society of the Old South. 
Yeah, I, I think locating it in emancipation is so important um, because it redefines, it recasts the, the Constitution and those two, um, the bricks and mortar of this, the pro slave Constitution, right? Yeah. But I think uh, I would love yeah, to get that's right. a little bit more about uh, Lincoln's journey toward emancipation because his, his thinking, like a lot of people, evolves over time. And he, but but you kind of argue that it was always there, in some form, right? Well, yes, it it, it isn't news that Abraham Lincoln always always hated slavery. I mean, he says so. He says, I always hated slavery as much as any abolitionist. And the only evidence we have suggests that that was the case. He grew up in an anti-slavery household. His parents attended an anti-slavery church. He claimed that one of the reasons they moved from Kentucky to Indiana was because of slavery, to get away from slavery. So there's no reason to doubt that he always disliked slavery. But he was not an anti anti-slavery politician. When he entered politics, he, he was a Whig, and he was mostly interested in Whig things like education, internal improvements, and the banking system, and those kinds of things. But he takes his first anti-slavery stand while he's in a young legislature in the in, in the Illinois legislature, and it's it's pretty modest, but it's there. It's unambiguous. You know, slavery is an injustice, and and in constitutional terms. The statement he makes is that Congress can, under the Constitution, abolish slavery in Washington, D.C. And that had by then become an issue because by then the pro-slavery constitutionalists were saying Congress cannot abolish slavery in Washington, D.C. because slavery is a constitutionally protected right of property. So, yes, Congress has the right to make all necessary rules and regulations for Washington, D.C., but it can't make rules and regulations that violate a fundamental property right. And Lincoln is saying it can. It can do that. And we know why, because he didn't believe it was a constitutionally protected right of property. That's early. That's already in the 1830s, right? So he's always committed. And then he goes to Congress in the 1840s for his one term, and he votes for the Wilmot Proviso to ban slavery from all the Western territories. Uh, but he's drawn into that he's still not an anti-slavery politician. He's not really an anti-slavery politician until 1854 when he's drawn into politics big time after kind of semi-retirement uh, uh, he's drawn back into politics by the Kansas Nebraska uh, debate over the with the repeal of the Missouri Compromise banning slavery from the Nebraska territory which uh, leads him to his first major anti-slavery speech and then from that point on it's very clear that uh, all of the positions he takes are grounded in this anti-slavery constitutional tradition that predates him right he's uh, he's a brilliant expositor of that tradition but he's not in the least bit innovative he doesn't add anything new to it and that's what i think makes him so useful for us because if he was making stuff up you know we'd say wow that's interesting but who else thought such a thing it's the fact that everything he's saying everybody else was saying you know, all the anti-slavery politicians are saying it's just that he's saying it better usually than most people. He's he's so articulate about it. It's like that. So by the time he by, by the time he becomes president, he has committed himself to abolishing slavery in Washington, D.C., banning slavery from all the territories, uh, due process rights for accused fugitives, slaves. Uh, and he warns that if you guys secede from the union. Uh, we're not going to return your fugitive slaves. And that seems to me profoundly important and something we've usually missed. So uh, I would say that just so that, again, so that listeners know and viewers know, uh, my argument, one of the things I'm insisting on and have been insisting on for decades, really, is that we underestimate the, the fugitive slave issue as a cause of the Civil War. We underestimate the degree to which uh, Northerners a, a majority of Northerners voted against the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. They refused to abide by it. It was widely disregarded, you know, and disobeyed in the North, which, which, and, 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 you know, the reason that's important is, is partly because it's one of the reasons the slave states secede when Lincoln's elected. And also because once the war begins, the territorial issue kind of recedes, right? Congress will go on and pass this law, it's a tiny little statute, 
statute that's, you know, one paragraph that says uh, uh, no slavery in the Western territories. There shall be neither slavery nor adultery. So, so that's taken care of. But the issue that becomes central to understanding the way the Civil War plays out is the fugitive slave issue. Having come out of a long history of of refusing to return fugitives, of making it difficult to get fugitives, of not wanting to return fugitives, it makes absolutely no sense to me to think that all of a sudden Northerners would turn around and say, you know what, we have to return these fugitives when they run to Union lines. But in fact, that's not what they do. They do exactly the opposite. Right from the start, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the earliest months of the war, barely a month after Fort Sumter, uh, 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 the Union general refuses to return them. It goes to the cabinet, and the cabinet uh, with Lincoln present votes uh, to allow uh, uh, a Union general to refuse to return fugitive slaves. And that seems to me... You know, that seems to me to follow logically from the kind of anti-slavery constitutional tradition that Lincoln brings with him into the White House. You know, and the, the growth that ha happens from that point on is basically the radicalization of that position, the willingness to go even further and, and be more aggressive about uh, about getting fugitives to emancipate themselves and finally come to the conclusion that uh uh, we're going to have to use emancipation to force the, enough states to abolish slavery on their own that we can actually get a 13th Amendment through uh, uh, through Congress and then passed by the states in a way that would have been inconceivable uh, in 1860. So yeah. it's, it's, it's not the, – the Civil War doesn't – cause Lincoln and the Republicans to become anti-slavery. It just radicalizes the anti-slavery politics that they had coming into the war. Yeah, and I think you, you mentioned in the book, too, that the Civil War fundamentally altered the balance. Um, yes. Prior to... Dramatically. And then afterwards. Yes, yes. You know, I mean, <laughs> if, 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 once 11 slave states leave... Congress, you know, then that's it. Then then the Republicans are in complete control for the entirety of the Civil War, and they can do whatever they want. And they do. Mm. They I want do. to take a quick little uh, detour over to uh, the, the military emancipation, because I found this so fascinating between the tension between a fugitive and contraband, military contraband. And um, just because it, it was so fascinating to me, maybe you could explain kind of how we still had fugitive slaves that were fighting on the side, well, that were in the Union still, that were right. border states. Yeah, well, okay. Uh, the contraband fugitive issue is interesting because the, the, uh, the, the, the legal rationale for refusing to return slaves to their owners, if their owners are from a disloyal state or if their owners are disloyal, uh, is that under the laws of war, uh, uh, you are allowed to confiscate the property of your enemy. And slaves were legally the property of the slaveholders in the southern states by law of the southern states. And so they confiscate them. Right. So they're called they're called contraband for that reason in the, in the first year of the war. But it became impossible to maintain the distinction between a fugitive uh, uh, who came from Maryland or Kentucky or from, a, you know, a, 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 a technically loyal state like Missouri and a contraband uh, who came from a disloyal state or a known secessionist, right? So, so the contraband sort of disappears and uh, uh, withers as an or as a rationale or a language, at least that that gets used in the earliest months of the war, and it just becomes fugitive slaves, and and eventually Congress just decides, and Lincoln decides that any fugitive coming into the Union lines, they're not going to return, right? And that's partly also. There, there, there are like intersecting legal claims that are being made. So one of them, one of them that gets made uh, is that uh, whoever is supposed to enforce 
the Fugitive Slave Clause of the Constitution under the terms of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which Northerners hated. Uh, uh, whatever you say about w those laws, there is nothing in those laws that authorize the Union Army or Navy to participate in the capture and return of fugitives. So right from the start, the 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 Republicans in the House vote like 99 to 1 to say uh, uh, it is not the business of the Union Army or Navy to participate. Well, you know, if the Union Army is marching through Kentucky and Maryland or Missouri, where which slaves, which states, slave states that have not seceded from the Union and therefore don't come under the technical terms of contrabands by disloyal, but the slaves are running to Union lines, then and the Union is and the Union Army is being told you can't return them. You know, then then you've set up a situation in which slavery is going to begin to crumble, even in the states that technically remain the slave states that technically remain loyal. Right. So they're using they're not using any single legal argument, but they're using a, a whole series of legal traditions that have come into play over the course of several generations. And that's one of the ones that matters most because because it it changes the way we think about the Emancipation Proclamation, because one of the critiques of it is that, oh, you know, he Lincoln freed the slaves in the states he had no control over and didn't free them in the states he did have control, like the loyal border states. <laughs> but the, uh, that's that that's a kind of logical inference from the language of the document that pays no attention to what's actually been going on on the ground and with union anti-slavery policy since the war began right so uh, uh, so if you look at what they're saying and look at what they're doing they know slavery's uh, slavery's dissolving in those states that were loyal because of the policies that the union army you know, that the federal government had be, been adopting since the earliest months of the war and i, th I yeah that's great and i think the um, we can kind of wrap up here with and it, it's a small question i think um you've kind of outlined how lincoln's thinking kind of evolved um, but you kind of make the point in the book that Lincoln is consistently moving towards uh, some sort of racial equality. And maybe you could think of, yes. you could talk about Lincoln's thinking about that and how that evolved over time. Yeah, I think uh, I, I, I said earlier, and I think very few historians would disagree with me when I said Lincoln was always anti-slavery and on all the evidence we have says that he's always he is not always a racial egalitarian. Right. In the 1830s, when he was in Congress, he, he, he not only did he show no commitment to racial equality, he actually introduced a law banning, you know, discriminating against blacks in voting rights in Illinois and stuff like that. And he used language. He's, you, people quote him. He used he used racially derogatory language. He told racist jokes things like that, like that in the 1830s. And that starts to subside in the 1840s. And it's pretty much gone from his rhetoric by the 1850s. Now, he's not yet committed to any actual political project of racial equality other than to say, uh, and it's, it's not insignificant, you know, uh, the principles on which the government was founded are that all men are created equal and they're in, or they are equal. Blacks and whites are equally entitled to their freedom, to, to their life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that is a racially egalitarian principle you know, precept that he is committed to. He is not yet committed to things like uh, equal voting rights or anything like that, or equal civil rights, but but to that fundamental, those fundamental natural rights. And and one of the things I argue in the book is that the more committed he becomes to an ambition, the more he becomes committed to a, a, a racial equality. So that by the time he uh, the war ends, you know, the famous last speech he gives, he becomes the first president in American history to publicly endorse black voting rights, which was the opposite of the position he had taken 30 years earlier as a young legislator. So I think I think his commitment to racial equality grows as his commitment to anti-slavery moves to the center of his politics. And as the war radicalizes his anti-slavery convictions, as it does virtually all Northerners and Republicans anyway, uh, he also becomes more committed uh, uh, to racial equality than he had ever been. So uh, it's not his anti-slavery that needed 
to develop, to evolve. It was his views about racial equality that needed to and did evolve, I think. Well, that, that's a fantastic answer. And I, I would just uh, like to give you a moment, if there's anything else we haven't touched upon that you would really like to drive home um, that's in your book that, um, you know, a point I haven't touched on, that would be uh, great. No, I think the only thing you mentioned it briefly in your in passing. I think I think it's on, it's important to understand that in between the anti-slavery constitutional logic and the actual policies they pursue is something I call the anti-slavery project that is based on the anti-slavery constitutional arguments, which prevent then from anti-slavery folks from advocating congressional abolition in a slave state. They develop a. a what I call the anti-slavery project in which they, they're going to make it harder to get your fugitive slaves. They're going to shut down the, the Atlantic slave trade. They're going to surround. They're going to they're, they're gonna maybe regulate the interstate slave trade, certainly the coastwise slave trade, ban slavery from the territories. And in there, if you surround the slave states with free territories, free states and free oceans, squeeze slavery slowly to death, like as, a, as, as the metaphor they used, like a scorpion surrounded by fire, which they believe it would kill itself. Slavery would die a natural death because slavery needed to expand to survive. So in between the, the, the broad constitutional arguments and the actual policies they pursued during the Civil War is this anti-slavery project that gets anti-slavery politics going. It presents Northerners, uh, American voters, with an actual set of policies that the federal government can pursue legally, constitutionally, that are designed to, in Lincoln's words, put slavery on a course of ultimate extinction. And, and it's that larger project and the constitutional reasoning behind it that leads the Southern states to say, once Lincoln is elected, we better get out of here. We better get out of here. This is a real threat. Uh, uh, and and we have to make a choice, and they make a choice. So, well, it, it's interesting. Uh, I talked to Paul Finkelman about two years ago about the John Marshall stuff, primarily. Right. But he made this one point that that uh, made me uh, laugh out loud. He said, "You know, the the slave states lose one argument and they leave." And it was such a, it was so funny because he was like, they lost sports and they left. <laughs> I actually, I should tell you, two days ago, Paul and I did a 90 minute exchange uh, on this, on this stuff, slavery in the constitution. So he's an old friend and yeah. he's a good historian.